points specifically later and complicate it. Right now I don't want to get into it because I haven't given all the preliminary concepts needed to really understand that. Um, uh, I'll go over this next bullet point rather quickly, but there is a complete rejection of positivist epistemology. And you can see why, right? In positivist epistemology, properly speaking, not revisions of neo-positivist um, accounts, but in positivist epistemology, properly speaking, and I've already done a lecture series on positivism, there is the belief that um, we only arrive at meaning, right? We only arrive at meaning insofar as that which we are saying, right, our, um, our language points to empirically verifiable um, claims, right, data. Everything that I say has to, so the classical example is, you know, um, the moon is gr made out of green cheese. Is, is that of any value? Is there any significance in talking about the moon being made out of green cheese? The answer is, well, only insofar as it can be verified. But there's problems with the pro positivist claim because even that claim is itself um, transcends verification, which brings a problem. So there's, there's just generally speaking, um, positivism is antithetical to structuralist uh, thought, post um, post-structuralist thought. Just a background. Next point, um, post-structuralism declares, and this is a quote, post-structuralism, and this is important too, right? Post-structuralism declares that the author is dead, right? So I'll talk about this, right? The author, author is, right? Post-structuralist um, thought says that the author is dead. That the notion of the individual, this is still a quote, that the notion of the individual subject is extremely problematic. Now we can understand where sort of this tension um, begins, right? First, I'll talk about this linguistically um, and within, within literature, within a lit, sort of lit crit analysis, but then we'll take it to um, an ontological account of subjectivity. Um, I won't do politics of identity yet because I haven't discussed that yet, but post-structuralism declares that the author is dead that the notion of the individual subject is extremely problematic and that all signifying practices are traces of language's grand circulation. Right? This is what Spivak has a problem with. Um, what ends up happening is that there is no final analysis in the interpretation of meaning. So, for example, imagine that I am the author of a text, right? I'm an author of this text. And I say that the text means A. Right? The question is, the, the fact that I say that the meaning of this text, right? The fact that I say the meaning of this text is A. Does that fix the interpretation of the meaning of the text such that this interpretation um, is not fluid, right? And the point is, well, think about if the author were to die. But if the author were to die, and the author isn't there to tell you what the interpretation of this text is, what the meaning, what the significance of this text is, how would we be able to arrive at what the author meant? The only way we'd be able to do it is to look through correspondence, emails, talk to family members, friends, compile all of this data, and then try to distill meaning from the information that we collected. What we end up um, recognizing, however, is that the author the second bullet point, the author has no primacy in the attribution of meaning in any particular text, right? So that when we talk about the relationship between the author and meaning, it's not technically speaking that the author is dead, right? But what's in a sense died, what is in a sense died in this post and I'll get into more detail in a second, what has in a sense died is the primacy given to the author's interpretation. Now, um, there are strengths and weaknesses to uh, post-structuralism, but for me, this is probably the strongest point, right? And this is probably one of the strongest aspects of post-structuralist thought. And it's not exclusive to post-structuralist thought. But what ends up happening, um, in a sense, is that interpretation becomes like this meaning, this interpretation, slash, P-R-E-T-H. Meaning and interpretation, like the relationship, and I've discussed this previously, the relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary, and this relationship is a condition from of the linguistic community. The linguistic community unifies these two arbitrary concepts or terms. Similarly, rather than saying that the author is the one who has primacy in the interpretation and meaning of a text, we recognize that it is a community-based, right? Like that 
I don't want to use the same term linguistic community here because that's sort of Saussurian, but in a sense the community has access to this interpretive um, account, that the community of readers has access to interpret whether or not um, and, and, and validate whether or not the text can be interpreted in such a manner. So what does that mean? So she, uh, we get the example of Humpty Dumpty, right? And actually I'm going to read this, this, uh, this section because it's pretty good. We get the access, um, the part of Humpty Dumpty. So listen, listen, to, this, listen to this bit really quick. Um, I meant there is, so Alice is in a conversation with Humpty Dumpty, and um, I'll read this. Torn between the desire to placate him and good common sense, Alice rejoins, I don't know what you mean by glory. So Humpty Dumpty explains, I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. So by glory, Humpty Dumpty says, by glory, when I say glory, what I mean is there is a nice knockdown argument for you. And then Alice says, well, but glory doesn't mean there is a nice knockdown argument. And then Humpty says, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, right? When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Neither more nor, uh, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things, right? Because then a word can mean an infinite number of things. And then Humpty responds, he says, the question is, said Humpty, which is to be master? That is all. And this is the point of post-structuralist thought, right? Um, well, the first point of post-structuralist thought is that in the attribution of meaning to words or to texts, in the attribution of meaning to the interpretive account, the author loses primacy, and that becomes communal, right? It becomes communal. Because we see here Humpty Dumpty, as represented by the author, Humpty Dumpty can't say that glory means a knockdown, drag out fight without telling Alice, by glory, I mean a knockdown, drag out fight. Because what ends up happening is that that interpretation of glory um, only has meaning for Humpty Dumpty until he translates that so that. Alice um, can gain access to what he means by glory, right? This um, is discussed at length by um, Wittgenstein in his account of private language, and I've discussed private language already. We don't have private language. The only way that Humpty Dumpty can make sense to Alice is by explaining to her, by glory, I mean a knockdown, drag out fight. Without that interpretation, they would never be able to communicate, right? So the post structuralist in that sense is um, um, basically, um, you know, there's, there's many different ways of looking at this, and I mean, Derrida obviously in his deconstructing, um, deconstruction account, um, all of this serves as the conditions for what is now defined as um, reader response theory, and I've talked about that, where um, the interpretation of the text, there are many ways in which the text can be interpreted, but proper or improper interpretations of text are contingent on a communal, um, a communal um, collective validation of an interpretation. You don't have access to just call it whatever you want. Um, so that's that's important. But I'll get we'll, we'll complicate this on an ontological level in a minute. Um, so post post-structuralists devalue or outrightly reject the concept of ideological formations, specific specifically ideology. And the question is, well, why? If we look at this, the notion of the death of the author, and I want to erase this because I want this to be clear. If we look at the idea, the notion of the, the death of the author, right? Death of the, right? If we recognize and look at the notion of the death of the author, and we see that, quote, um, individual subject is extremely problematic. The idea of the individual subject becomes extremely problematic. And that all signifying all signifying um, practices are traces of language grand circulation, the distribution of language throughout a community, in a Saussurean sense, the, the linguistic community to be specific. Then what we recognize is that an ideology, right? An ideology, roughly speaking, is nothing more than a collection of words, right? A collection of words, all of which have meaning, all of which point, all of which um, have 
and are justified by the linguistic community, but in 